Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Malu Dumim in Israel. One of the more annoying things in life is the feeling that somebody is looking over your shoulder. We all have to suffer through this experience at various times in our lives. A fortunate few may have managed to escape it shortly out of childhood or adolescence. Most others have to endure it through much of adulthood in the form of bossy parents, bossy bosses, bossy spouses, or bossy anybody else. Many people are able to liberate themselves from the dread of this feeling by simply ignoring it or convincing themselves that it is all for their own good. Others bear the agony in silent resentment, knowing full well that there is nothing they can do about it. Still others rebel against this form of servitude, sometimes successfully and others regretfully. It is a situation that is about as human as it gets. It is also about as annoying as it gets. It is likely that this form of behavior, both from the side of the person looking over the shoulder and the person whose shoulder is look, look, being looked over, stems from some evolutionary holdover from the animals. And many mammals do this as part of training their young to be able to fend for themselves in life. It is an instinctive method of preparing one's offspring for the challenges of living. We humans have adopted this training method and put it on steroids. We do it with everything, from learning new skills, to playing games, to dealing with each other on an interpersonal level. It is hard enough that we have to pick up all these skills and talents in the course of life, but we also have to cope with the suspicion that somebody is watching us struggle and fail and wondering when we are finally going to get it right. It has been interesting that this feeling is so annoying. It is difficult to imagine mammals getting all worked up over some parent watching them learn how to hunt or to survive. They probably instinctively appreciate it in some way, or at least recognize in their animal form of recognition that this is the way things are supposed to be. We also occasionally derive a sense of satisfaction from this feeling. It means that somebody cares about us and wants us to succeed, but this usually doesn't last very long. Once the years of childhood are over and some sort of independence begins to work its way into the personality, the feeling of appreciation frequently starts fading and the feeling of resentment starts creeping in. It's bad enough when it's a parent doing this. They, to some degree, have the right and the obligation to look over their children's shoulders, at least as long as the child is willing to be looked upon as a child. It is upon them to train the child to survive in the wild world. Teachers and coaches also tend to get a buy in this game. That is their job to a great extent, so it would be delinquent to not do this. But when it comes to a nosy relative or some over-interested friend or acquaintance or a boss who just can't stop looking for problems, things invariably get a bit messy. With complete strangers, it is widely seen as an invasion of privacy. What if the one looking over your shoulder was not a person at all, but a deity? What if that feeling came from the gnawing sense that God is watching you and noticing everything that is going on? Would this generate absolute resentment or would it be appreciated? God is not a person. God is something that we can ignore to our heart's content or if we wish to allow into our minds. What if our allowance of God entering our private space included this sense that God is constantly watching us and somehow hinting to us that what we are doing is either right or wrong. Is this belief a form of paranoia, or is it it a form of God consciousness? This week's Parsha is called Ekev. That short word means because or on account of. It really does nothing to suggest what the Parsha is about. It merely introduces the first verse of the Parsha, which takes us on a whirlwind tour of what life is all about according to the Torah. This is the last of the three parshas that comprise the first section of the book of Deuteronomy that deal with the overall history of the Israelites from the time of the Exodus until their entrance into the promised land and the overall purpose of why God chose them for this unique journey. The parsha is filled with promises of how great life will be if they just stick to the program and follow the laws of the Torah. The blessings that will come are the cl- of the classic biblical variety the fruit of your womb, the livestock, the fields, the safety from your enemies. Divine protection will take the form of uprooting all of the nations living in their midst. There will be utter panic among them as they realize that they are defenseless before a divine power. But with all these blessings comes an equal number of warnings. 
The first and most constant is the never-ending warning against falling into the temptations of idolatry. The second is to always remember their own historical journey, how God was there for them every step of the way. It will be easy to forget that journey and to try to convince themselves that it was they who were responsible for their own destiny. They accomplished all this and they brought these blessings onto themselves. This would become a constant danger lurking throughout Israelite and Jewish history. The constant threat against believing that it was all due to their own achievements and had nothing to do with God. The Parsha recalls some of the times in which the Israelites fell to this temptation. The primary example given is that of the golden calf. This catastrophic experience is replayed in some detail. Everything is retold from the 40 days and 40 nights Moshe spent on the mountain receiving the tablets of the Ten Commandments to God's warning to him that the people had turned to the worship of other gods. Moshe tells how he broke the tablets in desperation and pleaded with God to not destroy the people. In the end, a second set of tablets were made and the Israelites were given another chance. But the damage had been done and the incident would forever haunt the Israelites and the Jews. Following this, the basic program is laid out for them. It is spelled out in simple form. What God asks for is a five-step plan. To love God, to fear God, to act in a godly manner, to serve God exclusively, and to keep all the commandments. This, perhaps more than any other statement in the Torah, spells out what the true mission of the Torah really was and is. God is to be the end-all and be-all of their lives. It was asking an enormous amount from them, but it also promised great reward if it was truly followed. The Parsha closes with a small section about the uniqueness of the land itself, that it will be dependent on rainfall and thus under the constant threat of drought. This, in turn, will encourage the belief that God is constantly scrutinizing the land and the people to ensure that they are sticking with the program. The final sections of the Parsha include the second paragraph of, of the Shema Declaration, which has become the central prayer of Judaism. This paragraph emphasizes this idea that God will only bring the rain if the laws of the Torah are followed. While this certainly is not an easy belief for an individual to maintain over the course of a lifetime, and it is certainly a major challenge for an entire nation to perpetuate over the course of thousands of years, it does strike to the core of what it means to be a people dedicated to God. This would be the challenge of the Jews, a challenge which they both succeeded at and failed at with regularity. That little section about the uniqueness of the land is worth looking into a little more deeply. The key quote is, the land that you are passing into to possess is a land of mountains and valleys. It drinks its water from the rains of the heavens. It is a land which Hashem your God scrutinizes always. The eyes of Hashem your God are on it from the beginning of the year until the end of the year. That's a pretty bold statement. It essentially says that this land is different. The previous verse compared it to the land of Egypt, where the Israelites came from, which was watered by irrigation from the dependable Nile River. This land has no such advantages. Throughout its history, the land of Israel was known as a place in which survival was a challenge. There was always a danger lurking of a drought and then a famine. For most of its post-Israelite history, it was essentially a desert. There were always people living there, but they were always one step away from potential disaster. But this was the land that was promised to them. Why would God promise a land that would have inherent and constant difficulties? Why not promise a paradise that had no challenges for survival? Would that have been so difficult for God to give? The Torah seems to be addressing this point exactly in these verses. The reason Hashem gave the Israelites this land was because it would always impart a sense that God is scrutinizing it and the people living upon it. There will never be a time when this feeling is not present. From the beginning of the year until the end of the year, the eyes of Hashem will be upon it. But who wants that? Who wants to feel that God is looking over their shoulder all year long, every year, forever? Wouldn't people prefer some feeling of freedom from divine scrutiny? Freedom to do whatever they want without worrying about the consequences? Perhaps that is the natural way that people do feel but it is not the goal of the Torah. This feeling that God is always looking over our shoulder is the sometimes uncomfortable way of gaining God consciousness. 
It is only by the fact that the inhabitants of the land will always be looking to the heavens for rain that they will be able to remember God's reality in their lives. To this day, this frequently uncomfortable sense that God is scrutinizing us permeates many of those who live in Israel. It is, of course, a belief which is not maintained by all. Many ignore it or dismiss it as nothing more than biblical nonsense. But for those who do not ignore it and choose to fervently believe that the feeling is real, there is nothing more energizing about living in this unique land. It is like knowing there's a camera in the room and realizing that you can't just do whatever you like because somebody may be watching. Everyone is a little uncomfortable with this feeling, but we all understand that there is some reason behind the scrutiny. This sense of discomfort is one of the prices to pay for living in this land, but the price paid brings great reward. If one truly imbibes this feeling, one has become aware of God's presence in their life. Shabbat Shalom.